thought we had a really great show here, and I wanted to um, really contextualize it in a more serious uh, dialogue. Uh, the artist John Mark Edwards is here. Uh, he's shown for, I mean, I met him 20 years ago when he showed at New Space, and you were showing before that. So, uh, he's a veteran of the LA art scene and has always used, uh, it's always been this great play on text and yet abstraction. And I've always, he's been in a lot of great abstract painting shows, and yet it's, there's this, there's this uh, solidity to what he does, that, uh, conceptual solidity that is absent in a lot of abstractions. So I really want to delve into ideas uh, surrounding that. And uh, Jamie Brooks is a gallerist from Orange County whose program is Jamie Brooks Fine Art. Jamie Brooks Fine Art in, is it in Costa Mesa. <laughs> in Costa Mesa. And uh, his program uh, I've been following is, uh, has an emphasis on abstraction. And I think uh, there's a couple good galleries down in Orange County now that are really carrying the torch relative to um, what you might or might not see in the galleries today. Um, there's a wide variety of art out there. Um, how potent is abstraction? So, uh, Shana Nice Dambrot needs very little introduction, but I will try to recite her resume from memory. She's written for every print magazine that still exists, <laughs> and many that have folded. And she writes. She writes for uh, websites that come and go, and uh, she's the only thing left Googleable on them. And um, but she's a very well-known writer and a very, very thoughtful force in art, in in a, in a very glib art world. Uh, Shana who may strike you as a party girl, uh, has uh, certainly left us with a, a deep body of work. That's, uh, when you read it, it's all pretty impressive. Oh my God, you're rolling tape already, right? <laughs> <laughs> I want a copy of that. <laughs> and uh, Andy Campagnoni is the, oh boy, okay, this is gonna be hard to remember everything you do, but I'm gonna try, so bear with me. Andy Campagnoni <laughs> is the director, in, are you the director and chief curator? Yes. Uh, the director and chief curator of the Museum of Art and History, Lancaster, MOA. She is the president and CEO of AC Projects, which is currently floating between Pomona and Duarte. Is it's only in Duarte. It's only in Duarte now. It is. It has left. Elvis has left the building. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and Andy is, um, as a curator, she is a great champion of abstract painting. And again, at a time where it's pretty easy to find a lot of. Um, other styles and, and um, a lot of trends. Uh, she's very committed to, to a pretty strict curatorial vision. And uh, so in, in this day and age, it's, it's pretty impressive. And so since we have here the pretty much a, a little conglomerate of champions of abstraction, I wanted to, uh, to have this be like a pro. Uh, but I did want to get into the idea that, that there are somewhat variables in abstract painting as it exists now especially compared to, say, classic abstraction in the 1950s. Um, so why don't we start with the artist John Mark Edwards. And jo John Mark, if you obviously want to tell us a little about the show, and how abstract is it? And, and do you consider yourself an abstract painter? And, uh, and, and take it from there. Has everyone seen the show in terms of walking around? Uh, the piece, the sculptural wall relief called Text, is uh, reminiscent of my earlier work in which I take letters and compose them into characters. So I was doing that for 20 years, compressing them, making them look abstract, but they were actually legible. So for me, um, abstraction. Right now. <laughs> Here comes a riot. Oh, my God. USA win? Here comes a riot. I think that the Portuguese from the... No, they did? Here comes a riot. Make it quick. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, to make this quick, uh, uh, this show uh, takes the negative space of text called counter space and uses that as a form to build the paintings and the surface up while leaving the text or letters or what have you as debris on the floor. So uh, that's how this whole show started. And I also wanted to deal with Matt's floors and how to do that in a creative <laughs> way, which is where the installation component came into play because I knew that would be a big, um, 
what character is in this piece. So uh, getting back to my older work, uh, I felt like the text is a natural culmination of ready-made and, uh, what do I want to say, Greenbergian abstract expressionism and all the you guys will be able to talk about it more, but the formalities of painting critique, and I thought these two combined uh, is what got me interested in text as painting in the first place. So to answer Matt's question about abstraction, it is abstraction. I could go on further and probably will during the course of this, but that's my first salvo into this whole panel. Great. Okay. So we've established that it is abstraction because some people I've had I've had discussions with people who felt that uh, the work because there was such a conceptual event that it, it, it was too it was too tied it was too locked into something to be abstraction which goes beyond. So um, and uh, maybe maybe we, moving down we can ask Jamie uh, as a gallerist do you find that that uh, um, that it's easier to show work if there's a hook you know an abstract painting that's a pure abstract painting. Do, do, do people want to discuss like there's got to be like why are, is there a grid here is there a rhythm to this does this does this mean something what does it signify I mean how do you what kind of hook do you use for the abstract paintings that you you exhibit um, <clears throat> Well, I think like to basic to start off, um, I think there's as great a hook in his work as there is an abstract expressionist work, and um, in terms of uh, the work I show, I show a lot of minimalist work, so it's it's, it's a different type of. Uh, uh, do you consider it to be? Do you consider minimalism to be abstraction? Uh, it, technically, yes, but I don't feel that in my heart. It's more. That's a good answer. But I mean, what do you what do you do then? It, it sounds like you're you're, you're abstract, positive, but, it's but it's not abstraction. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah. Al you're almost positive. Right. Yeah, it's like uh, a lot of the work it, it, it provokes a mood and uh, 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 provokes uh, you know, thoughtful analysis with the same as John Mark's work. Um, but in John Mark's work, I'm looking more at um, symbols and, um, uh, and not looking at specifically text, but... The, the idea of text? The idea of text. The right. Yeah, so I, I'm thinking more of uh, 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 calligraphy and but in that way, it becomes representation. But see, the characters, I mean, and this is like the whole, like, semiotic, you know, art history, nerd land, fissure part, is that letters are not a thing. They're a representation. They're a signifier. They're a sign to begin with. So you have this kind of hall of mirrors where it's a thing, and it's an object in that way. But it's totally divorced from its function as language because it's illegible and out of any kind of order. So it kind of almost like goes back and forth. But he's using it more as an image, I feel like, than as a communication component. Yes. Yeah. So well, especially in this show. Right. The language or the letters or the words or the text are more concrete. Right. Than physical. It's not like it's another, not. like when you think of text based art where there are words and right. there are you know and maybe a story and you know all of that this is not that well there, there there was a kid who came in who probably had one of the most pressing questions of the show why aren't there any numbers <laughs> <laughs> and he was very he was he was very concerned there's numbers you spell them oh oh, 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 oh i wish i had well, so then they go back to the house right yeah. Yeah. But letting the viewer have the freedom to do that Viewers are very important. So, for me, oh, okay. and the mirrors and bringing them into the piece or the gallery as a component of my subjectivity. Well, yes, that's the thing because you, we talked about this. So I wrote a catalog essay for a body of work that's most of what's inside, but there's been new work also. Um, and it's still really relevant. When we were talking about it, you were saying, well, you know, I know what happened while this is being made, but I'm not attached to anyone else ever knowing that, and it's like it's fine with me. And it kind of, there was this really nice kind of conceptual, almost kind of poetic resonance with that, 
and the fact that what we were actually talking about was empty space and kind of the stuff that got thrown away that you and so it was all about just you know not um, boxing yourself into meaning which I think is what people think of when they think of what abstraction is good at and also people are going to do that anyway so you might as well accommodate that in the work that you know so in that sense they still you know I think of the the outlines of the letters as more like mark you know make mark making Right, like where the little lines fall across over each other and they build up and fall away. I just think that it like almost like drawing. And, and you had a question. So. Uh, I have a question. When I look at the show, I'm really intrigued with that space between all of everything, yeah. which is what you were going for in the first place. But my question is, then why do you Because I feel like the installation is so strong and like. I'm so intrigued by all of what happens and how I was here when they were setting up and there was talk about, oh, should we leave the letters? You know, leave the letters there. I walked mm -hmm. through the space and stepped all over them and they changed as I walked. But then I was confused by the change. Like, what? I don't I mean, maybe there was, there's a reason that I'm not. Uh, well, the paintings are important because they bring into play the idea of space around language or letters. And I wanted to use that to form and articulate the way the paintings are made and built up. In previous paintings, I used letters or words and drip the painting and the paint goes around the letters and they emphasize the language. This is much more about the in-between space of meaning and all the space around meaning. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. So. You've written about a lot of art or law across the spectrum, not just that abstraction. Where is the, as a writer communicating to an audience, where is the audience for abstraction? Um, well, you know, here's, okay. I, all right, well, so, all right. Um, like, I guess everywhere and nowhere or whatever in the sense that the audience for abstraction could be a little bit more not, it could be less specific, less, like, demographic. Be partly because, um, there are, in a sense, fewer, you know, something that I might experience as a way into the painting runs the risk of being something that is a filter that keeps other kinds of people out of a painting based on, like, taste or background or all that sort of stuff, right, audience stuff. But, if, you know, in the absence of those, you maybe gain something in accessibility, but then you lose something in sort of, you know, expressing an experience or some kind of, like, specific emotion or you know, so I think that you, it's kind of like a scale, but I think that, um, just, you know, I say a lot of times about work that it's not decorative, but it does what decorative art does, except it is, you know, not decorative work. Like, and I think, you know, some of this work, I mean, you just pull people, I mean, there's a lot of painters, especially, you know, this kind of slow thing that goes on in LA, like Andy and Susan, and just like all that stuff, where it's non-representational, it's beautiful, and it does like the thing that you know a giant painting in the lobby of some place gorgeous needs to do, but it's not this kind of superficial one note nothing art. It's this substantial, well made, crafted, conceptually rigorous, lovely painting. But it's that it can live in the same space that might be reserved for something like a hotel. There's no rule that says it can't be, you know, that you can't get an artist to do like you know, a hundred, you know, works on paper in serial form and use those as, instead of framed prints of apple cards. And sometimes people do that, and it doesn't bring the art down to that. I think it expands the audience because people are expecting something a little bit more bland. And smart curators and designers and the space producers, you know, have been able to be uh, increasingly willing, I think, to put more conceptual, you know, more contemporary, you know, slightly more difficult, a little bit edgier, but nothing, you know, with the right of a hate mail about it, kind of, you know, and that there's a lot you can do with amazing materials, well, non-traditional stuff, and so I think the audience is, like, in a sense, infinite. Speaking of smart curators, we happen to have one on the panel, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Andy, how would you bet, where do you bet as a curator when you bring in an abstract painting to the museum, is there such a thing as too decorative? Is there, do you know it when you see it? Can you articulate? Like, is there what line, what abstract painting do you put in, and what abstract painting do you keep out? That's a question for you. Yeah. 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 Ye
the work, and I, I think that any, it doesn't matter what genre it is, it doesn't matter what the style is, it has some kind of color attached to it, all art should be a representation of the sign of our time that is being made, the time that it's being made. So it's a little bit more difficult in abstraction, whether it's painting or photography or sculpture or whatever, to still find that essence of that time that the artist was creating it. You know, our art is our anthropological record of our time. I mean, you guys are all making things that 100 years from now is going to represent what we were about. Our culture, what's, what our thought process is, what the economy was like. And so abstraction, I think, is a little bit more difficult to do that, but that's my moniker for, you know, does it do that? Does it best represent the, the artist in this moment or the time it was made? So if it was made 30 years ago, does it best represent the moment of that artist making that work and the time and the space around that artist? Or you can tell when you see a piece that's purely decorative, it doesn't do that. It's not about that. And it doesn't, right? It doesn't, it doesn't speak to you. No, it doesn't. There's no purpose for that. And that's, for me, the difference of what from right. showing one and not the other. Jamie, does decorative work sell better than tough abstraction? <laughs> but probably across the U.S. It does. But sure. it goes to Mesa, it does. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I think, you know, decorative art doesn't extend beyond whatever aesthetic pleasure an individual gets from it. It's not, you know, there isn't any sort of transcendence. And, um, it, and so, I think decorative art, and this may be, I'm not trying to sound snobbish, but uh, it... Uh, You're among snobs. No, it, it appeals to a wider audience. And, and so there is a there is a function and purpose for it. And, uh, I think it's yeah. deployed to a wider audience with low expectations that exactly. they don't serve. Yeah. So I think that, you know, the things I've seen, especially in hospitality design, you know, like restaurants are like the new art museum piece right now. I mean, you know, kind of, right? Like, don't like, you know, hashtag that, like, I'm, you know. But I mean, I really, I kind of mean that. Like, you know, if there's, you know, people are building these big, gorgeous spaces, and instead of just doing like, a red wall element, they're hiring an artist to do something that's almost maybe site specific or at least, you know, they're not just like, t you know, picking something up that'll look good there. They're getting someone to come in and, you know, use materials and be, re you know, reflected and have it be, you know, this sort of, you know, real thing as part of their art practice. But it does what a nice red feature wall would do, right? Or it livens up the space, but it's like it's not, it wants to be spectacular, it doesn't want to be boring, and it wants to be one of a kind, it wants to be special, they go to artists, and like nine times out of ten, that's going to be abstract work, because it's architectural, let me know, but it does. Let me, let me shift the gear here, and, and talk more, because the one thing I find with abstraction that, that seems to be, in place of discussing the content, people discuss history, they discuss the historical lineage. They, they, you know, and this is an abstract painting, and Gorky did this, and then Pollock did that, and then Reinhardt did that, and now this guy is doing that. There seems to be this kind of reductive historical lineage and an a lot of abstraction, and this is more on the commercial side, but also on the critical side a bit, as far as um, a, a mild pigeonhole of, well, we can talk about your autobiography and the narrative of our history, and that's how we can take your art seriously, as opposed to, oh, it had interesting subject matter, and, you know, symbols of content. Do you, do you find yourself, John Mark, um, do you find yourself in any particularly historical lineage? Do you, do you, I mean, and, and you're among friends, so feel free to, as your dealer, I can, I, I want to drop you into like, oh, you know, like, if, like if you look at conceptual art and you look at abstract painting, there's a person who merges the two. I want, I want to, I, I would like to show you as, a sort of newborn, you know, as a new way of making art. Um, but do you do you see yourself in a lineage? Are there artists that no, have really influenced you? I think the lineage died in the '60s when you know multimedia and dance and Warhol and all that stuff happened. And uh, so I think that, like I said, the Greenbergian idea of abstract formalism and expressionism kind of died in the '60s and. It created a flourish of 
new materials, new media, new ways of painting, and um, so in that way, I feel I'm more, I don't even know what subgenre I would belong to. I would leave that up to someone else. I like the idea that I have the freedom to pursue my work in a way that it directs me as I finish each painting. It tends to tell me what to do next or after the show. I love having the text on the floor and having people make words and it's pretty amazing to see kids being really excited in a gallery and I was doing stuff and uh, they come up to me and ask me, you know, what, why is this falling from here and, you know, I love that kind of interaction. And so I don't know if that exactly no, no. answers your question. I, 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 was think, I was thinking along the same lines because it's tough to put your art in, in one of those. I, it, so many artists strive, I believe, Abstract painters strive to say, "Oh, you look at my work. I have, you know, I, I followed what Takuni did, but I, you know, and they, what they're really trying to do, or, or a classic thing would be to say, I studied under in in in, in, in many many genera." And, and I, I will say, some of the passion from those days gone by, I feel I have some of that. In terms of the reason we love Pollock is not just because of the splatter, but he was engaged in the moment before the paint hit the surface. He was engaged with the paint for that momentary second before it crashed. And I love that about Pog, not so much the painting, but that engagement, the materiality, and that moment in time. I think when people look at Pollock, they're not just looking at Splashy, because thousands of people have been doing it since and before, but it's knowing what all that came into being. Well, Matt has. Jack Pollock tattooed on his arm, but no, but no art. No art. It's just the, it's just it's the, the guy. Yeah. It's yeah. Just him. No art. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so I, I actually, I had an art history teacher talk about the fact that he, he believed Pollock was actually painting in the air, and he believed it was like a peak of American culture in that they had won World War II, and, and here they were. It was like there was, you know, you were, and then and then everything crashed after that. So. So that was, it was an interesting narrative, but he said it really amazing, and the, the guy had this great delivery of Austin Ashbari, maybe a number of years ago. He would say it was this elegant artist, historical lecture, oh, it would be so great. And then in the other class, somebody would give a lecture, and some student would have to do an assignment about a painter, so they would they would parrot a Donna Shavari lecture, and it would be like, and it was the peak of American culture. It would be like, oh my God, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. So, you know, it's, a lot of it's in the delivery. So, uh, but Jamie, what role does history play on the commercial side? Well, it's all pro and, you know, the past is always pro And um, I think the challenge for the artist is to to um, not get over concerned with the history. Well, no, 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 but you're the dealer. Yeah. Should you get over concerned with history? If, 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 for example, when, if somebody comes up and they if they say like, oh, we, we own a Donald Judd. Yeah. I know commercially it's like, oh, we own a Donald Judd. It's like, oh, well, well, you know, do you run them over to a particular artist? Do you try to say there's a lineage here? I mean, is that is that? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of accusing well, I, history I of being a sales when you, when you refer to previous people, it diminishes the originality. And so it's not something I would... Say. I've been doing it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think you know, one of the things you try to do is to talk about um, the unique voice, not the, the past lives. Right, and then the artist can to a set of ideas that are attached to one movement or two movements, and it, it can only be this. It can't be yeah. this. Yeah. That's really dangerous. You know what you mean? mean? And it's funny because it's almost like, okay, so I love to have that conversation with an artist, right? I love to sit with a painter and get all like down in art history and pull and unpack all that stuff. But I don't necessarily put a lot of emphasis about it when I write about the artist later. So it's kind of like you want to know, and you want to like that well, art, you know, that's, know I told you we're art history nerds, right? Right, and they, what they've been looking at. Right. Because a lot of times it's surprising too, so it's really interesting, because that's what you're looking at, but this is what you're doing. And that, you know, is a little insider baseball, but it's, you know, we're all here we are, right? Okay. So that's interesting, but I definitely agree that you don't want to lose that. Is it? Uh -huh. you know what I mean? Well, now, yeah. your, your museum has a permanent collection. 
and, and, and you've assembled some of it, but some of it was there when you came. Do you ever say, oh, this isn't supposed to go with this, but I think they go with it? Do you, try to, do you ever try to throw a curveball to some, to some sort of narrative when you, when, you, when you display the art? Well, yeah, if there's a narrative. You don't construct it. Well, yeah, it's my narrative. I'm the boss. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but not. I, I think that the the, um, well, for, for example, the issue of the the whole art historical thing. I think it's relevant. I think we should know where things came from. We didn't just pop out of nowhere and just like had this idea. But again, I go back to like we're here in this moment, in now, in this place, in this geographic region, and what is relevant to our ideas in this moment right now. Uh, it doesn't matter who did something 200 years ago or how great somebody can move paint around or how realistic they can make the features in the face. Really what matters is how are we effectively communicating what's happening right this second when we put paint to the canvas, put an installation on the floor. That's the important part. So the next thing that abstraction gets pigeonholed in, besides history, is process. I find time and time again when I curate shows that involve abstract paintings that the subject gets reduced to process. Oh, how did they do that? What, is there, is there, there's some significance in the way it was done, the manner in which it was composed, the materials that were used, and the significance of those outweigh anything of just the finished product. Well, the thing is, though, I think that's just because people want a story. Right. And that, if it's, an, if it's and that's the only story you're giving them, they're going to want to know that story. You know what I mean? It's just human nature, I feel like. You're looking for something. And so, you know, if all you've got left is, wow, how did he do that? Tell me that story. That, that it's almost like the, the engineering. Do you, yeah. do you come across a lot of that, Jamie? Well, I, I, I don't really personally write work that is process-oriented. Um, I, I like work that is um, uh, product rather than process, and so I don't come across it a lot. But you know, I think as as a society, as we become more technological, more and more work is going to become process oriented, and I, I, I see that already. Really? Well, what do you mean? Do you mean that? Is it because there's like a short-term novelty factor of if you're using new technologies, people wanting to? know more about that and be interested in that? Or do you mean that it's like a backlash where as stuff gets more and more, you know, distanced from the hand of the artist that there could be like something that comes up behind that to rethink it? I think that's already Which I think has yeah. already happened. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 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 Well, I think TV, yeah. we have this conversation all the time where it's like TV screens and internet and virtual and flatness and all that is the reason why, you know, I think the reason why there's more performance art is the same reason why the new Jack White records on vinyl, or people throw their own food. You know, make their own pickles or whatever the hell that. You know, saying with like slow food, painting, performance art. It's all to me that part of that. You know, which is all process oriented stuff. If you want to really think about that. Yeah. And I think it's because there's a craving that's been generated by pushing all the newness and the flatness of everything else. But do you tell us about the John Mark. Tell us about the process of, of painting. Uh, from the ladder. The process. How did you ladder. do that? A painting from the ladder. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Uh, that was, uh, you know, pretty basic. I started at the top of the ladder, painting lying on the floor, drop the paint down, and create. I start with the darker colors first, and then work my way in, and as you splatter in, you create cosmic splashes. <laughs> But it does, it does have a process where it, if you're on this part of the ladder, yeah. it's going to do this. If you're on that part of the ladder. Okay. Yeah. So um, I think I should open it up to some questions. Does anybody have any questions? I have a whole bunch of them. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, there we go. Well, it's just a lot of, I just, I'm going to, there's no way I can compete talking about it. Or that's why I make it. But there are some, several things like the, the process, like my work, as, you, as many of you know, is really kind of based in an older generation's work. But I, what I do is I try to use all new materials, all new methods, and the process is really important to make it look kind of the same, but different, answering the questions. That was one of them. 
trying to think of a couple other attractions. Here's a perfect example of an artist who's transcended multiple generations of art making with resin. Congratulations for being old. Right? <laughs> that, but that has effectively captured a moment every single time. Every single time you've applied that material, it has been in the moment right now capturing that moment. It hasn't been, oh, I'm making the same thing and I'm saying the same thing I did 30 years ago or 40 years ago. Well, that's kind of an interesting that's thing, too, is like, how does an artist know that they're, like, if you're pursuing something, and if you're not thinking about the artist and art history around you, how do you run head on, not run head on into something that's already been done a lot? Without paying attention. Well, I think cultural philosophers, you know, there's enough of them that would tell you that originality is impossible whether it's your goal or not. So I think, what, but I love what you said because what I was at and I was actually thinking about that was, you know, I think the best you could do, and actually, in my opinion, it's actually a little bit more interesting when there is a hybrid quality to it. So if you're using traditional materials, but you have a very different kind of visual language than those have been used in. If, like, for example, people who sculpt in, like, white marble but do, like, crazy contemporary shit, so there's a tension. Or the other direction, if you're using traditional materials but you're doing something that's completely yours, you know, the, the more factors that, you, you know, you're kind of allowing in that are in your brain, whether you acknowledge them or not, the more chance you have at actually getting somewhere original because your accumulation is original. Instead of like, you know, obsessing on having like one thing that's absolutely new, you actually, you know, you're, you're new in the way that we're all individuals. And if you can get to all the factors that make you who you are, that make you individual, then you are individual and original and that. But some of that is your parents, if you're a person. The, you know, the analogy is where you come from. The city you grew up in. And I think that art history can function like that. Is there anybody else? You don't have to, you don't have to talk about your art. You can't, no. <laughs> what about uh, the idea of the authentic or authenticity? We were just talking a little bit about originality, but um, maybe, I don't know, I mean, I guess that's really big for a general how do, you, how do you keep your work authentic? How do I? Well, I don't have any assistants, so I have to do the work myself, <laughs> as opposed to a Jeff Koons who hires his work out and they paint it for him, and this is what he wants, and you know, no one's, you know, that's the way of working, and that's what he does. I think we run into that a lot, and you're like, oh my god, that painting is so beautiful, where's the artist, and then it's seven people, you know, that help get that painting completed, which goes back to the Renaissance, and Peter Paul Rubens did the same thing. You know? I've always felt if you can get seven people to help you in your studio, make a movie. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, got, you, you, have, you have the whole crew, so I don't, the, the, the idea that making art outside of the individual is, I mean, I could see getting, getting your canvas a stretch, but after that, you know, call me a purist. So oh, the here. idea of authenticity is really about juxtaposition of what you want in a painting. Maybe it's merchandise or product, and it's not about being authentic, but more about selling at a hundred thousand dollars. Maybe that's the goal of the art. Or a million. Jeff. Yeah. Uh, Andy. Andy. When you talk about painting in the now, and that, you know, the moment you do that, that's gone. Right. So that's an idea. Right. And a sustained idea would be classic. But when you're doing work, uh, as an artist, most artists I know, you're not painting an idea of this is going to be classical work, this no. is going to be... Right. You're doing your work. <laughs> and and you, you, you added on your palette gravity, you know, yeah. which I think is interesting, mm -hmm. you know. And there's a lineage with Pollock and gravity. But time is something I don't know that, unless you're doing a different kind of art, like a performance art, or futurism or something like that, it's not on your path. So I don't think it's um, an abstraction. I don't think it's necessarily uh, required. You think, you oh, think I don't that think it's just abstraction that it's required. I just, that's how, when I look at work for a curating show, mm -hmm. thinking about what would be relevant for the museum's collection, mm -hmm. um, I think about those things. So that's really important. I'm, I'm buying work for a collection that was made in 2013. Where yeah. is it? How, yeah, am I, how am I telling the story? Because I'm 
that's my job as that's a right. museum curator to tell that story and to find those things that will be relevant 50 years from now that will be able to adequately tell the story. And it just happens that I live in the same time and in the same place. And so for me, it, it's easier for me to look at that and say, oh, that does tell the story. Right. I, versus, I, I you know, someone looking back and trying to buy 200 year old work and say, did that really tell the story or was that just the thing that survived the fire? <laughs> or, uh, but what is going to survive is going to be told in uh, 200 years from now, you know, right. you cannot manipulate that. Well, you can't, with, I, think, I believe that with an institution, like for example, the Louvre manipulated what was in the Louvre stayed in the Louvre. So, and, and things were added onto it because, oh, it was the Louvre and it had this impressive collection of the past. And the role of the institution in a lot of ways really is time capsule. And while we cannot manipulate what will be shown in 200 years, we can we can sure place our chips on the bet. Like, well, we want we want to we want to make sure they have a lot of, you know, I mean, Mocha right now is or the Broad is definitely going to say we want to make sure in 100 years there's a lot of Jeff Coons for people to choose from <laughs> to say, oh, that's what that's what the year 2014 was about, Jeff right. Coons. So but the problem so. is like not the Diego. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to depress everybody. <laughs> We'll do something cheerier later. <laughs> that was the sad part of the movie. It'll get better. The military painter Messonnier was the biggest 19th century artist in the world at the time, and when he died, you know, Van Gogh and all those, just, he was forgotten immediately. Yeah. His paint, his prices plummeted, and you know that brought in the impression. That's the happy part of the movie. Yeah, but one of my favorite, yeah, what well, was one of my favorite things that museums do, and they're doing it more and more, is inviting contemporary artists to interact with and respond to their permanent collections, uh -huh. whether by going in and curating from it, or in the case of Big Getty, of um, you know making new work for it, or you know responding to someone you know from 200 years ago in their collection, like go in and pull out these Friedrichs and make you walk, you know, that you're the Volca, right? Everyone's a curator. So, no, but I'm just saying like that you know, is the kind of thing that I was, you know, that fits under the same kind of umbrella that we were talking about, you know, there's like, that is a way of interacting with the past that is about the present. And so you actually, it's like the combination of phrases, borrow a phrase, but I feel that way. And so that is like one, you know, a prism of the past is one legitimate way to regard the present. And so the more tools you have to do that, I mean, I went to art history school, so obviously it's like go team, but I really do feel like there's obvious there's value there. Not, you know, not every artist makes the kind of work that's about that, and so great, like don't, you know, don't, no pressure. But I love it when it happens. I think it's a really salient exercise, so it's just that kind of thing. Do you have a question? Do you, do you ask it a question? No, no, I'm fine. Oh, you're okay. okay, okay. I have one more thing to say about time, which is just really suggesting your idea. Um, artists do deal with time in that dry times on their painting can be very critical if they want them to dry fast, they might crack quickly, or if it takes too long to dry, that could be a problem putting them up. So there is a time element. That's true. That's true. Yeah. You can't get through one of these panels without materials. <laughs> Oil or acrylic, it's got. <laughs> so, any, any, anybody have any, you. any more you questions? I, I just have a general question about the artist's point of view, bringing attention to their moment of expression. Um, the, oh, sorry. Um, the artist in the moment of expression is, I believe, in a true sense, just not intentionally creating for the genre. So, in that space, after the work is produced, how do you see the work coming to the attention of the gallery that will bring the platform for the audience or the museum? And who brings the story in? What, who is the storyteller in that exchange? Who defines the work? Most, I, I, to, to summarize, most most art, if, if I tell me if I'm right, most artists don't come in with a completely codified. This is exactly what this artwork is about, and you cannot think of it outside this context. Many people that they encounter within the many avenues of the art world throw in their ideas or their perceptions and their labels and their pigeonholes, um, and champion it or not. And so what is the process whereby a work goes from being just an object to be to having all of the additional stuff that makes it valuable? 
You went like that, and then you turned right away and looked at me. If this is what does that, yeah. right. this is what does that. You can't. People, you know, you guys can say what you want, but I might call bullshit, and then Andy wants it for a show on a, total, a topic I never thought of. And, you know, I think it's, it's a cumulative sort of conversation gets labeled and, you know, not always in a bad way, um, you know, over time, you know, and, you know, not to, like, be evasive about it, but it's like, you think something that if someone says to you, well, have you thought about this other stuff, you are the kind of person that may very well go, no, but I will now, like, that's great. So you're welcoming of that, so it's not about pigeonholing or keeping people gatekeeping, it's about what else? What else? How about that? Let's add that to the conversation. But are you Let's talking talk about, about getting your work out of the studio, or yeah. you're, you're what do you say to a dealer? Work? Like, I make this kind of painting, so what does that work? Exactly. Yeah. I, I just want to bring attention to how much power you, each of you have in the world of bringing focus to the work of the artist. Well, I, I would I would turn it around because the minute an artist has any economic leverage. Uh, they're much more powerful than any other player oh, in the art world. Yeah. So, so it's, it, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough pyramid to climb, but once they're like, the, how do I get a gallery, how to get a gallery, and then it's like, the, 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 well, I don't need to be with that gallery, or what, what are you going to do for me, or I don't, need to, I don't need to have a gallery, I can sell out of my studio. I think, I think I'm focusing on emerging artists and not the ones who dictate who's for the galleries or museums. I, I, I think that's what I'm trying to say. It's a fine line, line because on the one hand, you don't want to truncate any kind of, as, you know, something that someone might want to add, you don't want to stop them. Right. But on the other hand, there's a degree of helpfulness. If you give somebody a couple of keywords they can start to think about from, that's not a bad thing. So you just have to not overdo it. And, well, and it really all comes down to also visual. Does it work? Yeah. When you look at it, is there something there when I see it and I don't know you, we haven't had a conversation on the telephone and you send me your work and I look at the, the JPEGs and the images, am I going to get it or kind of get it to want to call you and say, hey, let's, let's have a bigger conversation. Story, yeah. Let's right. find out what's behind this. That's the most, the most important element in that is that, that initial look. And if I don't get it and it doesn't work visually, then... Right. Right. Exactly. Right. Horrible, but I know you. Yeah. Has anyone ever gotten your work wrong and like told you what they thought about it? And you were like, oh my God, they're they're like, this is the opposite of everything I stand for. <laughs> People earlier would get very pissed off at me because they had to decipher the work, which is a lot about my work is deciphering it and putting the viewer to come to terms with what they think the work is about, and they don't like that. They were lazy. Yeah. They just wanted it to be spooky. They wanted yeah. it, yes. What does this say? What does this mean? I don't want to think about it. I just want oh, that's to awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to your question about uh, emerging oh, artists, yeah. how do they get to become artists? Uh, for me, it's, it's having a unique voice, absolutely. When you talk, um, you're talking about the sculpture and the marble, and, you know, I immediately thought of Elizabeth Kerr, mm -hmm. and where a person is not far, that's a part of the brand of um, the changing technology and, and, and uh, new ways of uh, doing art um, provides a lot of opportunity to, to further have new voices. And I think that you know, people that are coming up right now are establishing and doing things in ways different um, than it has. Any more questions? Okay, okay. Raise your hands. Raise it. <laughs> this is an abstraction game. Ready? Ready, begin. Are we raising our hands or not? Everybody! Bri Brian, you got to count. Okay. <laughs> Brian's got to come out here and count. Okay. Okay. This is the abstraction game. Show of hands. you got choice. Rothko or Pollock? Rothko. Count, count real quick. Hold high up, high. Put those hands high in the air. You can't vote. You can't vote twice. I'm very by you. Which is more? No, no, no. Which do you like better? Oh. Rothko. Or Pollock? Okay, this is Rothko. Okay, this is Rothko. Okay, you got it. You got it. Okay, Pollock.
Bronco. So, so kids shouldn't vote. <laughs> <laughs> Those kids are going to be the tiebreakers. <laughs> Quick, educate your kids about Rothko and Paul. <laughs> right. Well, this is very, this is a very enjoyable little discussion. And you want more? Oh. Okay, I asked about process. I asked about history. Well, clearly you have questions. What about perception? Inadequacy of language. Is abstraction at its strongest when it goes beyond language? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's why it's visual art. Right. That's visual art. Yeah. Try to tell some people. It really isn't that what it's for. You know, when it loses the literal, it's Yeah. No, I mean, I think that... Then why is so much language... Why does so much language surround art? If art goes beyond... If art's successful... If art is successfully... Goes beyond language, why does so much language surround it? Well, I mean, it depends on what you think the writing is for. If the right, you know, if the writing, the is on. <laughs> if the writing is to finish what the artist failed to finish, that's a problem. If the writing is because of why we're all here, which is that language is how most people. I mean, you can say that painting transcends language, but for people who don't paint, language is kind of what is kind of where it, what's happening. It's kind of the jam. You know, saying it's like what we got. So I think that there is. Um, a usefulness in talking about it in the, but I think it's, if you think of it in the correct way, from what I view as the correct way, is that, you know, the language that surrounds art is, you know, sparked by the art. And maybe it doesn't even end up talking always about the art, but talks about what people are feeling or what their response to the art is. And that's about the issue of the living people and the space connecting to each other. Even if it's uh, like you're saying, surrounding the art, I think that's the way to say it, surrounding it, but not the thing, so, and not an apologist for it. Well, I think know. also too. Oh, oh, the the artist, so that huh? people can talk to one another about it. Yeah. Because your reaction to the painting, you don't paint to each other. <laughs> I mean, you do. Some people but then might. It's fun to talk about it. It's, very it's, very very it's like wine. Yeah, you, you talk about wine. Bottle of wine. You talk about movies. You wouldn't drink it by well, yourself, right? Speaking of well, wine, <laughs> we have a sale. Yeah, I mean, these people are clearly people who would drink a bottle of wine. All right, all right. Well, yeah. I would too, but isn't it more fun to have the wine with someone else and share it and discuss it? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Because I was going to say, I mean, art, art should be an experience, and we all like to discuss that's our experiences right. and share. So that's where the language comes in. John Martin, who was the first abstract painter where you went, wow, that's just, you, the wow came I've always been a huge Jasper Johnson, so it's oh, not totally, really... Totally, totally that work. Oh, yeah. oh my God, great, right. because <laughs> it's not <laughs> abstract, it's just flat, it's a map, but yet it isn't. It's a but it's an abstraction, because what is it like? It's totally, yeah. But see, that's an example of why the past, like, I know something about you now. Yeah. Like, in this time in front of me, I know that that's in your mind, and I feel like knowing that increases my understanding of the work, and so there you go. That's what it's for. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really wow. Who yeah. was the first abstract painter where you went, wow, and it just has always stayed in you? Wow? You know, interestingly, I was, uh, I was always attracted to pictures of painters as a younger lad. Wow. And uh, it wasn't until I got older that I got attracted to abstract painters. So last week, who did you want to know? 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 Who Wait on, wait. Now, Yavich for abstraction, it's kind of like saying your, your favorite band from Ramones. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like you can't go, no, I'm not kidding, I'm just yeah. can't go wrong with it. Yeah, yeah. but it, it, like, it really, it like, like, that's why I was 12, and I was like, what the hell is this now? And I just became obsessed with it, and now everything just comes around. Cool. And you? Um, besides, besides you. <laughs> uh, two, two major moments in my life. One, growing up in Claremont, growing up around like the hard edge, um, you know, the Carl Benjamin. I mean, that was what I grew up in. It wasn't like, oh, we saw that on a museum wall. That was in the house. And that was, so that was big, but I think the real big moment for me that I bawled my eyes out the first time I saw it was um, a mother well 
can't remember the, which one it was, but I came around the corner at MoMA, and I was pretty young, and it was there, and I just started crying, and I don't know, it was such an emotional moment that I have to say, if I had to pick any abstract painter, that would probably be one of the ideas, just based on that one. Is Marcus really down there? I have. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> hey, does anybody have any more questions? This is the first panel I've ever had anything to do with where they go, oh no, we want it to last longer. <laughs> Those panel discussions are like, oh, get it over with, get it over with. <laughs> All right. Oh, can I say something just to yeah. uh, back up to what you said? Walk away. <laughs> I am the biggest champion to emerging artists, and anyone who knows me that's an artist who's worked with me knows that I am that person. And I, I love to work at work. I love to come to your studio. I don't charge you. I, I'm, I, I, there's so much to see, and there's so much being made that isn't being seen. And I want, I love looking at it. And so I'm happy to come visit anybody at any time. You know how to get me at the museum? Send me an email, and I will be there. And as, and as far as Coagula, we, we have the Marquis de Sade policy. We, we appreciate all submissions. Well, let's hear it for the panelists.